What up, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, Jesse Warden here. Today we're going to cover an introduction to Tailwind CSS. Jesse Warden. What we're going to cover is what Tailwind is, who is it for, like what's the demographic, kind of hinted at it, and how you install, develop with it, learn why you're using it, and how do you deploy to production. We're going to cover all that today from scratch. Now, Tailwind CSS has changed my life. It helped me learn a lot of CSS I didn't know, and it made me extremely effective on projects where I had to do a custom design. I have been spoiled massively in my career to always work with either A, a component framework where I had to code no CSS or very little padding, maybe a breakpoint or two, and that's it, or I had a web designer. So when I say web designer, I think of myself as a web developer. Think of that large matrix that Chris Coyer, that web that he created, and everyone on the right is an extreme coder database person. On the left is a designer, product owner, someone who cares about the user. And somewhere in the middle on the left side is someone who is really good at design, but also is really good at CSS and understands JavaScript and HTML. And having that person bridge the gap between JavaScript developer and designer, that person can really take any design, convert it to CSS for you, and together you can make it work and functional. So what do you do? when you don't have that person or you don't have a component framework, you got to be a web developer and use the third thing called CSS to make it look like the user comp that the designer gives you. And so that's what Tailwind is really targeted at is people like me who have to do CSS and are not CSS rock stars, but want a framework that works with them. And I can spend my time working in JavaScript or TypeScript or Elm around HTML and designing those components and not have to deal with CSS, not have to deal with SAS or less or compilation systems. So what do you do when the designer didn't use a component framework like Bulma, for example, which is just CSS only? It provides classes that you just literally attach to an HTML tag and voila, you got a button. You can add little parameters to it, additional classes, and voila, you got a button. So you have a design framework with all these components here that you can use that are CSS only, and you can add your JavaScript on top of this to make these functional and kind of build out whatever the designer created for you. If you're a React developer, very similar, you have component frameworks like Material UI, which give you those components, but they also include JavaScript. So you can be a little more effective in having some of the components already work out of the box and you're just giving them data. So a lot of the work's done for you. The designer would take this, create a visual design comp of the application, and then you just assemble it with your code on top, composing some of those components together and adding data. What do you do when the designer hands you this? It's not a component framework. It's a raw Figma design. There's no JavaScript written. There's no web components. There's no React components. There's no Angular components. There's no Svelte components. All of this you have to write from scratch. You try to explain to the designer that this would be a lot easier with a custom component framework instead. And the designer's like, yeah, but for branding reasons and visual reasons and the best user experience, we had to use these colors and these fonts and this way of composing things together. So suddenly you're like, oh man, I have to code all this from scratch, which means I don't have a component framework. And if you don't have a web designer at your disposal, but you know JavaScript, guess what? You're now the web designer. <laughs> so you have to do all this yourself, which means not only just this, but then what do you do for mobile? What do you do for tablets? What do you do for those smaller screens and larger screens? So you got to take this design and then figure out what are the breakpoints. Sometimes that's on you. So that is what Tailwind can empower you to do is these kind of custom designs that a visual designer gives you, but you already have JavaScript and web development chops. You're just not that great at CSS or it's not your strong suit. You're more on the right side of Chris Coyer's web of web developer. So when we talk about Tailwind, what is it? Well, it's a simplified CSS. If you imagine taking every CSS property and value out there. So let's say there's a 10,000. Now you divide that by two. Now you have 5,000. So you've significantly reduced how much you have to really think, remember, and learn. And that is just significantly healthy when you're a beginner because it's a lot less to learn. You can get one thing and know what it does. That's not how CSS works. Normally CSS is a name and a value or name and value. So the display property has block and static and all these other ones. Position has this, this, and those relate somehow. And if you're an experienced developer, it means there's a lot less you have to remember because you have these nice little abstractions. So that one thing means those two things. Or this one thing by default is an easier way for me to take this default of background color, just call it BG white. So if you're familiar with like, let's say Bulma, it's a CSS only framework. There's no JavaScript involved. It would be more, more akin to that versus Bootstrap, which has CSS and JavaScript or Foundation, which has CSS and JavaScript. Instead, 
you have all the classes that they provide, but they're not high level. So for example, Bulma has a class for button and you apply it to the button and it looks like that. But that's actually made up of a bunch of colors and other CSS properties in that it makes it a really big thing. Tailwind takes all the primitives. So literally the raw CSS in the spec and says, here is the primitives. And so every CSS there. The second thing uh, out of the four is it abstracts all the CSS properties with reasonable defaults. So it doesn't just say like, here's the background of BG, right? It gives these really short name prefix names, but it also gives you reasonable defaults such as colors and a varying shades of those colors. And the naming conventions allow you to imply what's there. So if you don't know the property, you could probably guess and you're most lucky, right? And so that DSL or domain specific language they've kind of created around CSS. Once you learn the prefixes, you can actually guess what the other values are without having to look it up on the website. So it makes you really, really effective kind of once you learn the language. And the third thing, which I think is one of the most important, is that they have a website that documents pretty much all of Tailwind. Since all of Tailwind is an abstraction of CSS, they document all of CSS. So how many countless times have I Googled the Flexbox layout, had that Chris Coyer article up and scrolled up and down to see how Flexbox works then go back to my browser and play with the different controls, right? Imagine if you had a single website to do everything for colors, flexbox, flex grid, background color, border radius, text colors, text layout, different fonts and weights. It's all right there. It's on the same page. You can see on the left side. And so helping you learn and reference is as powerful with visual examples. You can see what padding looks like. You can compare it to what margin looks like. Super powerful. And then fourth, it has a command line compiler. It's very similar to the Elm compiler where it does two things well. It allows you to take an input and get an output of some kind of CSS file to a CSS file you'd actually use on a browser. And if you want to optimize a production, you put the optimize flag and call it a day. There's other features, but that simplicity is what I love about it. I don't have to learn SAS, a new language, a new SAS workflow. I don't have to, four years from now, update the DAS to the Dart SAS, even though I'm not using Dart. Like all those problems go away and you just say, look, I don't want to spend any of my time in CSS. I just want my compiler to work with me and my workflow, and that is JavaScript and a little bit of HTML. So that's what it provides for you. We have an empty folder here, so let's go npm init y. That'll give us a blank package JSON. Then we'll install Elm for our application framework, very similar to React or Angular. Elm Live to get hot module reloading, so you can save and instantly see our app. It'll recompile at light speed. And then Tailwind. CSS, which is the command line compiler that they provide as well. Put that into development dependency. Fantastic. Next up is to generate a basic Elm setup, which doesn't do much beyond the Elm JSON. That's okay. We'll fill in the blanks here. So give us an Elm JSON and a source folder. So Elm JSON is very similar to your package JSON, just deals with Elm packages. We'll create a main.elm file and a index.html file. So the two basic things we need, le app, dot com and we can copy pasta the application they have if you're not familiar with what this application does you click a increment button and see the zero right here and increases it and if you click the decrement button it reduces that number or decrements it so we're going to copy paste this as our basic application template in elm copy pasta coding for the win to begin any new project then we'll copy pasta the html we're going to enhance this a little bit here add our own script tag here. It's going to look for an elm.js file. This is what our compiler will output our entire application in a single JavaScript file. Then we can utilize all the magic global variables that it injects. So let's go to our package JSON and we're going to create a start. We want to run elm live to go ahead and compile our source.main elm file. We want a start page to be our own custom source.index.html. We want Elm, so we're gonna put the dash dash to put our own command line flags to Elm. We want the output file to be Elm.js. Because we're in development mode, let's go ahead and put our time travel debugger up there so we can actually see everything. Let's test this guy out. So we're gonna say npm start in a terminal. It'll run it. It'll go on localhost 8800. So let's go to localhost 8000. We see our app, fantastic, we can click Plus, minus, our app works. We can open our time travel debugger here and we can decrement those messages. We can time travel in the past and see our app update and our data update. We can see what actually happened. And if we hit save, it should automatically refresh it. It does, fantastic. So we've got our Elm application set up. We can write code and see it refresh. Next up is the CSS workflow. We're gonna do another terminal. Let's say MPX, Tailwind, init. 
This will create a basic Tailwind config that configures Tailwind. The content is, where am I looking for uses of Tailwind? Click on Docs and then hit Apple K or Command K. It'll bring up this window here and you can search for things like color. So let's say text decoration color, fantastic. So each one of these Tailwinds are an encapsulated class that they abstract away, right? And so what the way the command line compiler works is it looks for you using this stuff in your code it then compiles it into CSS. So we got to tell it where to look. So where we're looking is in our source directory, any folder and any file name, as long as it has an HTML or JavaScript. Now this isn't comprehensive. We're actually missing one, but I'm going to keep this here on purpose to show you how it can break and how you fix it and how you debug it. And out of paranoia, let's just put it local. So there's no miscommunication. I'm just going to go in the source folder and call tailwind dot CSS. Now this CSS file is gonna be our source file. So there's gonna be some kind of compiled output. So Elm Live or Webpack Dev Server, things like that will kind of handle that stuff behind the scenes. Tailwind is not gonna do that. It's gonna create a real actual compiled Tailwind build CSS on the fly very quickly. In Tailwind 2, it was very slow unless you enable JIT, and 3, it's super fast. So that means we need to include that artifact. So there's gonna be a Tailwind build here. The defaults for that are the Tailwind director of all the base resets, components, and things like that that make CSS normalized and pretty, get rid of all the default padding in the browser, make every browser look the same and have reasonable defaults. Then they're gonna add their components on top, and then any utilities that help build that. So let's put a watch CSS, and we're gonna put Tailwind CSS. It needs some kind of input file, a source Tailwind CSS. So that's the the CSS is going to take in and compile things out. It's going to identify not just this, but also what you put in your code. But this is actually pulling in the Tailwind config. You can override this to another config file. It's going to pull this in and put additional configurations beyond your input. It's going to say, oh, also, before we compile, make sure they're actually using those styles in this source code. Okay? The output is source Tailwind build CSS. Now the reason we call it build is so it's very obvious that this is our source file and this is our build file, the file that it built to, compiled to. This is also the file we're going to include in both our development HTML and our compiled HTML when we make a production build for Elm. But we want to do this while we code. So we're going to put watch. So anytime we change anything in our code or in our CSS, we want the whole CSS to recompile. So it's not just our code changing, but also our CSS changing. Okay, so now we have two that run. And before we run it, let's go ahead and implement our CSS files. So we'll take out the default styles that Ellie had, and we'll add in ours, which is href of Tailwind build CSS. There we go. And you can see now it's actually reset everything. So all our but default button look and feels are gone. The text is normalized. And you can see it's now loading our seven kilobyte. There's not much CSS in there. So I want some kind of background. So I'm gonna do Command K here and say background, size, origin, no. Let's try color, text decoration, maybe background color, perfect. So we hit enter and we get all kinds of BG things. All right, let's talk about this because this is one of the main values that Tailwind CSS provides. It's not just the tooling and the classes that you can use in your app, but the actual website itself, the documentation, search capabilities, and visual examples. All of Tailwind has a the DSL or the domain specific language starts with a abbreviation usually of the property name. So BG would be background, right? And then they have a dash to be some supplement property. So BG inherit. Then they show you that's their class that they provide you and you'll use. But if you're curious kind of what it does behind the scenes, sometimes there's more involved. They show you the actual CSS property that it's writing behind the scenes. Now, again, for BG Color, sometimes they have opacity and other settings. Specific browsers have prefixes. They do some math with CSS math and variables. But for the most part, this is, this is what you use. This is the CSS behind the scenes. If you're trying to correlate, hey, I know a CSS property. What's the tailwind equivalent? So you want to search backwards and what it looks like, right? You can see a visual of all the colors. So if we scroll down, we can see the, the colors that they provide. So they don't just provide gray, they give you different shades of gray. So this is what I mean by not just a property, but some kind of reasonable defaults that you can build in turn, right? And they have all those. So if you search for like, let's say red dash, 
you can see they provide different reds, different blues, and things like that. So a lot of the colors out of the box, but you can customize these if they don't quite match up your comp, whether it's from Figma or some other design system. And then secondly, they give you a visual example of what it looks like. So this would be Indigo. And so you can see the visuals. And as you scroll down, you can see what it would actually look like with those properties without having to try them and set it up yourself. And sometimes you might think you have the right property for, like, let's say, a text value, and you're not sure. You just scroll down, take a look, and you can see the different implementations that they give you. An example would be Flex. I do this all the time with Flex, but also Flex Grid was kind of new to me. So if we go to Flex, they kind of group Flex and Flex Grid together. But if you've never done Flex Grid before, this is where I learned Flex Grid. I didn't find yet another Chris Coyer's article to learn from or some other famous CSS person. I literally came here and said, okay, columns, I understand about rows and columns, got it. I read a Flex Grid article, so I, I've got basics. But I can see visually how the Flex Grid would work. I can see the properties I need to do. And then they give me example code I can use. And so that's an example of exploring what CSS properties are there, seeing the tailwind the class that they provide you with the, the actual abbreviated name and then some parameter or version of that with the reasonable defaults that they usually provide as the third parameter. And so from there, I can construe the exact same thing that would probably work for row. And I can scroll down, see examples, use that visually to see, all right, this is what my design will look like if I use it. Then go try that in the browser. That's a, a really huge, wonderful addition that Tailwind gives you. Okay, so BG Blue 600, we'll go class BG Blue 600, hit save. Now you'll notice that it's not over there and you're like, what the heck? I added it, I have my compiler set up, took 15 milliseconds, what is going on? So the first thing to check when you add styles and they just don't appear is to open the build CSS and we'll look for blue. And you can see blue is nowhere to be found. And that's because when Tailwind compiles the CSS in Tailwind 3 onwards, or if you're using version 2 with JIT set to true, it's going to optimize. And so it's going to look wherever that Tailwind configuration was set up to look. And that means any HTML file or JS that you write the word BG Blue 600, it'll go, oh, okay, cool. They want to use that style. I'm going to go ahead and compile that in. They're not looking in our Elm file. So let's change that to Elm, hit save. It'll recompile which is super fast. Then we'll hit refresh. And there we go. We got our blue. Fantastic. When you hit command K, be really bad about searching things and it does its best. It's, it's a pretty good regular expression for searching. The other way is it's teaching you CSS. So I know background color, but there's actually a lot involved in background color, at least the way that they've decided it. So if you inspect that element, there's a couple things I want to show you here. The first is that we can see our color is on that particular button. So that's, that's good. It's a very one-to-one -one relationship so far. I want that button to look like this. I had this class from Tailwind. If you hit the class, you'll see that that actual class is applied and you can toggle it on and off. So if you look at the top left of the screen, as I click over and over, it's toggling on and off. So that allows you to debug this as your styles get bigger. Second, we can see that applied color or that class of really what it does. It does a color with an RGB, which is helpful because I don't have to memorize the exact blue color and tweak with RGB values. Second, it does math based on a variable taking in the opacity. So very advanced CSS. Now I know from my front end days what opacity does. It kind of makes it slightly transparent at zero to completely opaque at one and then anywhere in between. But I don't know what this vendor prefix is. So a lot of this stuff is kind of a gateway to learn more about CSS if you want to. But if you just want to know background color, like that's it. So see, Tailwind gives you a really nice soft introduction, really simple to memorize. One property that could be a bunch and that's what I mean by cutting things in half. We'd like to explore other properties, such as how do we make it maybe padding? I always get this mixed up. Is it padding or margin? I don't really know. So we'll, we'll try both. Padding's the same way with the whole P prefix. Instead of padding, they say P. But they have interesting ways of combining that in kind of their own domain-specific language or DSL. So instead of doing a padding left or padding right, right, specifically with a PR or PL, you can combine it with X. And so it allows you to kind of compose that DSL into a dif different language. So let's try some padding here. We want that button to be padded maybe a little bit on the left. So is it padding L? Maybe, I don't know, 10? I'm just going to guess. Let's see what happens. Okay, that's good. A little too much. Maybe four. Fantastic. Okay. And then PR. And again, I'm guessing. I don't even know if these are official numbers. They kind of have official names for themselves. Let's make that six. And let's try to do a padding Y. So we want padding on the top and bottom of maybe four or two. Let's try two. There we go. See, I think that's a nice button. 
The only thing I don't like about it is the text isn't the right color. So then we go back to Tailwind and say, all right, how do I do color again? So you type in color, it's like text duration color or text color, I don't know, this one looks good. And if you're again unclear, you just kind of scroll down and you can see all the classes available for it and that's fantastic. So is there just like a text white, which is the opposite, that'll work. So we'll say text white. If you really want to play with these things, it's really difficult to do in Tailwind 3 without going back here or just guessing, right? That's really not a cool thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to Tailwind 2 here. So let me uninstall Tailwind. I just want to show you this feature I really loved in Tailwind 2. I'm hoping they bring this back in Tailwind 3. You never know. So let's uninstall it, and we'll specifically install Tailwind, Tailwind CSS at V2. We'll install two. It has about the same API, which is fine, but you'll notice immediately as soon as I run the compilation that the speed is atrocious. So let's go npm run watch CSS. And before I do that, let's just take a look at the package JSON so you can see that it's using version two now instead of version three. And it's in dependencies. We'll take that out and put it here in a minute. So hit run. One thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one thousand, five, one thousand. I'm a slow compiler. I should be written in Rust. All right, so it took about five seconds, but there's a neat little thing that came with that willing to wait, and that is every single Tailwind style, which means I now hit P. Look at that code hit. I can play with every single style now. So if I can try 11, I can hit Enter, toggle it on and off. Let's actually click on the button itself, my bad. Okay, and you can toggle these paddings off. Let's play with some other padding. So we could do PL. And so now you get code hints. You can actually see what's in there. So if you want to play in the browser and then say, all right, I like the padding left of, of four, and I like a padding right of four. How about four? There we go. That's a little bit better, which means that we got to change these guys to a padding X of six. Cool. I like this. And so you can see how you can play and kind of like toggle things and off. Not only can you learn what classes are available in Tailwind, but you can also play with them and turn them on and off and see which one you like. Then... If you're so inclined to level up your learning, you can go see how they actually implemented it inside the CSS. Once you've got something you like, you can then copy and paste that over to your Tailwind CSS class files or class definitions on your actual component itself. We're going to go back to Tailwind 3 so we have the nice fast compiler, but I just wanted to show you that that option exists. And because Tailwind 2 has the same API, just be aware when you do that, that you're not going to have some of the new... Tailwind 3 features, which are really nice, like reflections, and there's a lot of other neat classes in there. And you know you're back when you have a super fast compilation time. We'll hit return. Last, I think, little touch would be, how do we get, like, rounded corners? So I say rounded border radius. Maybe that's it. I don't know. Yes, okay, I want it to look like that. Fantastic. So I can literally just see visually what I want and copy-paste. I don't have to learn the CSS behind it. I don't have to learn why. I don't care how it's implemented. I just copy-paste, and let's uh, let's give it a shot here. So we're going to go... Background blue, text white, and rounded MD. Oh, absolutely fantastic. I think the only thing left is it's kind of done the CSS reset, so everything's kind of touching each other. Margin, that's the opposite of padding, right? So let's try, I don't know, maybe a margin of two. Is there an M2? I don't even know. Let's just try it. Oh, no, but it broke my rounding. I think it's MD. There we go. Cool. So see how quickly you can screw up and save and fix your stuff? I like that. Before we move on, there was a subtlety there that I want to make sure that we pick up on before we move on to building components. There's two things you saw there. The first was that I keep adding class after class after class to the class keyword. So whether you're using React or Angular, you're going to get a really large string in there. So you don't have to use strings. If you're from a type background, like for Elm, for example, or TypeScript or Rescript, they have type definitions for Tailwind that are not just for spellings, you can make correctness, but if you're just interested in, I wanna have a more composable way of doing things, you don't have to make massive strings. However, that takes some getting used to, of having these massive amounts of classes. But if you're from a component background, you're actually okay with that because you're eventually gonna abstract that in component. The second thing is that when you're trying to debug styles, you'll notice that I was going to the CSS panel and I was clicking things on and off to play with the style to see how it looked, maybe how it feels, if I like the way it designs, because sometimes design is very discoverable, right? You make the design and you look how you feel. But where you debug is on the HTML node itself. You don't have to correlate to the CSS panel, look at the computation stuff and see what's there. It's very clear what padding it has applied. It's very clear what margin. And a lot of the cascade and inheritance, some of it, goes away because you can read it. 
right? The Flexbox and FlexGrid is still using a lot of the CSS stuff. But I just want to bring that up that it, it takes some getting used to, to have a lot of those classes in that massive string or in some kind of composed way if you're using a type language. And then being able to debug, you're looking at that tag and you're seeing what Tailwind classes are applied. So it's a lot more obvious what's going on because you're looking at the tag and the classes that are one. There's no like disassociation there. So we have our button. It looks good. We feel good about the final design of it. But we're going to have an application that uses a lot of buttons. Do we have to copy paste this gigantic set of Tailwind classes over and over? No. If you're from Angular, React, or Elm, or Svelte, or any other UI component framework, you know exactly what to do. And that is create a reusable component. So we're going to say our basic button. And buttons, just like every other component, take two things. They take attributes, things that go on the, the tag, such as class, right? And then they have things go inside of it, such as the text. So we're going to say the button has some attributes and it has some contents. And we're going to take our button and we're going to <gasps> copy pasta coding for the win. Okay. So we like this class. So we're going to go ahead and set this style up in the beginning. And that way anybody else can use our component. But we want to give them the opportunity to add their own attributes or maybe override those classes if they would like. So this is how you add lists together in Elm. Think about how you add items in array. In JavaScript, we do structure or do array.push. It's the same kind of thing. That's what plus plus does. So we'll do the same thing for the contents. Now, there's nothing in the button contents, but you know how components are. If you wanted to extend it later, it's there if you would like to. Go use our component. So you see how this one's using our component? We're going to get rid of the class. And it should look the exact same. The only difference is that it's customized with its own on click handler. And it has text internally. That's plus one. So now we hit save. Cool. The only thing we changed, remove the classes and said, use our component. Now let's do the same thing to the bottom button. Voila. You now created components. And so you don't have to duplicate all of those styles in there because they're duplicated for you. See how that works? So it's using our basic button. So if you're a component developer from Angular React, this should be extremely familiar. But at the same time, you can go back and tweak something if you're like, well, it looks good at the top and not the bottom. I want to tweak things. And you have that ability. That's, that's fantastic. Last up, we have to create an optimized production build. What does that mean? Well, the code that we're using here for Elm has two problems. The first is that it's not optimized for a browser. It has debug information in there, and there's possibly debug logs, things that are unsafe for production. Elm compiler is smart enough to know that when you put an optimize, it'll not even compile until you fix those things. So we're going to start with a build Elm. And this will allow us to build our Elm effectively. So we're going to say Elm make. We're going to use the raw Elm compiler here. Say source main Elm. And we want the optimize flag. So it'll know that it's going for a production build. It'll give us compiler error warnings if we leave logs in there. And the output JavaScript will be optimized for super fast kind of stuff. It's not going to be uglified, but minified by everything else. So you optimize. And then our output is in the build folder. So if you're familiar with like create React app or Angular when you do production builds, we're doing the same kind of thing. It's creating a build folder for the optimal assets that we would deploy to our production website or dev and QA, whatever. So we'll say output is build slash LMJS. Set that out real quick. Say npm run build Elm. It creates a build folder and puts our LMJS in there. Next up is we have to do a optimized build for Tailwind. Now, I kind of said that before we're doing an optimized build, it's only about 400 lines of code. It has only the tags, CSS that it detects, the classes that it detects you're using in your source code. And that's great. So let's copy pasta this and we'll change about three things on this command because there's one additional thing we can do that's built into the Tailwind command line compiler. And we'll say build CSS, copy pasta shell code. So we're going to remove watch because we want this to be a one-time deal. And second, we're going to change this to the build folder. So we don't want to put it in source. We want to put it in build. We would need to add one flag, and that's minify. So it'll take that CSS and make it even smaller. Not too much, but it, it, it works exponentially better with more classes. So it's a good thing to do. So we'll test that now and be run build CSS. And if we look in the build folder, you can see it's all one one line now. It's minified it, shrunk it significantly. And if we compare and contrast the file size, we can see our build CSS here is eight kilobytes. And if we look in the build, just minification alone is three kilobytes. So just very little effort by adding one flag and it's super fantastic, super fast compiler. Absolutely love it. 
just some housekeeping. We need to get our copy to move over our source indexed HTML to our build indexed HTML. Not much has changed. Hashed that out. NPM run copy pasta. Fantastic. It's copy pasta. We need to do a clean. So if we run this multiple times, we want to rimraf the build folder. Otherwise, be true if it's not there. So right now it exists. So we're going to run npm run clean. And it's going to delete the build folder. But if we run it again, it won't crash. It'll be like, oh, it's not there. So it's an idempotent operation. Now we can bring it all together. Compose dim commands, bruh. We'll say we're doing composition in imperative land. How cool is that? npm run clean and npm run build elm and npm run build css and npm run copy pasta npm run build test it out oh so gorgeous good to go your stuff's ready to go to prod that's how you get a production build of your tailwind build css with your existing pipeline of stuff using just simple shell scripts you could use pipeline operations i'm just showing you how to do it in node that is Tailwind CSS, ladies and gentlemen, utilized in a front-end development process. Tailwind changed my life. It made me feel a lot more secure, despite the fact that I've been doing this for a while. I get nervous when I've got very custom designs and I'm supposed to use CSS to do it rather than something like Elm UI or using raw primitives on Canvas, for example, to get the design just so. Now, I can use the real design primitives, the CSS, to build any design that's thrown at me, but still use the same workflow, and that is... I don't have to spend any time in CSS files. I don't have to learn SAS or less. I can literally just add classes on my HTML, build my components in the exact same thing I've been doing forever. And I feel really empowered, but I can still have a, a simpler way to learn a lot more about the CSS properties using those abstractions. And if I need the control for branding reasons, I can go into Tailwind Config and customize it with brand colors and brand styles and things like that. But see, it has the same workflow, just has my custom colors. If you're used to doing a CSS only style framework where you just add a class and you get a button. Now you just add a couple other styles, you have a button and you just turn that in component, right? So it's a very similar workflow from that. Tailwind is for people like more application developers, JavaScript developers who don't know the CSS or they want to create their own design primitives and they don't know where to start. That's a, it's a wonderful way to teach you and do it. For experienced developers, it just makes you faster. There's a lot less to learn. It can encapsulate that, and it still allows you to look at that Tailwind set of styles, know what's applied because you know Tailwind. And so if you're a CSS designer, you can look at existing code and say, okay, this is this is how this component looks. These are the styles, and it's very obvious how it looks like that because all the styles for it are there. There's no like linking in your head like 50 other things. You still got to do a little bit of that with Flexbox and Flexgrid, but for the most part, that encapsulated block of all of those little styles, those little abbreviations added to that one HTML tag helps you debug it better. It simplifies it. It simplifies the CSS. Instead of learning all of CSS, you just have to learn half. Basically, that one thing of background color for white does background color white and then some of the opacity things. A lot less to learn, a lot easier to get up to speed. The website documents everything. So if you want to learn FlexGrid, you want to learn Flexbox, you want to learn text styles, they're all there on the website. And if you don't know what to search for, you can just scroll on the left, look for text, and read all about it with all the examples there both the CSS and the Tailwind examples. So it's just a wonderful learning tool for all levels. I just love how the command line compiler, especially in three, is fast out of the box, uses the JIT compiler. But if you want to do an optimized build, you just add one flag. That makes your DevOps really simple. You don't have to use this Webpack nonsense and roll up, blah, blah, blah. You literally just compile, go all about your day. I just, I love that. Check out Tailwind if you're looking to build stuff that are custom designs. My name is Jesse Ward. And you got any questions, hit me up in the comments. I'm more than happy to help.